phenomenal um, speaker is uh, on my team and I am just pleased as punch. <laughs> that shows my age, doesn't it? Um, to be a part of her world. I learned so much from her and could be her mom probably, but she's brilliant and I love listening to her and I'm going to turn it over to her. I'm going to start the record. Um, I'm going to go in and check and make sure everybody got out of the waiting room to the best of my ability. So enjoy the last of three of which grass is which today. Thanks everybody. Thank you so much, Peggy, and good morning and welcome everyone to our final day of the Witch Grass is Witch series. Like Peggy said, my name is Erin Garrett, and I'm an energy and environmental stewardship educator for University of Illinois Extension. So if you are unable to join us for one or both of the other two webinars, um, we are going to start with a refresher today. So even if you have been tuning in, this is still um, a lot of information, a lot of terms to cover. So we're going to start with a brief refresher of our um, grass identification terms and things that we should be paying attention to. And Erin, and then, I'm going to interrupt you. Just give me permission to record. It's telling me I need you. So then you can keep going. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Better to do it now. <laughs> awesome. That way they can hear you again. There you go, you should be good. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Yep, okay. Um, so after our initial review this morning, we're gonna dive into identifying some nuisance grasses that can be found in Illinois. And we're gonna start by talking about what that, that term means and why I chose to use that term to describe these grasses. So as I mentioned in previous sessions, most of my grass identification knowledge is self-taught and based on field experiences. And that's the approach that we're applying to learning um, how to identify grasses, is keeping it simple and trying to find practical, easy characteristics on these grasses that you can look for when you're out you know, hiking or walking around or just in your backyard trying to figure out what grasses you have growing there. So when I first learn how to identify grasses, I needed to distinguish between desirable native species and undesirable non-native or invasive species that needed to be managed. So today's grasses are ones that I came to be familiar with really quickly. Um, and a lot of them are the grasses that you're going to be able to just go right outside and see around your home or office, whether you want them there or not. Um, that's the habitat that a lot of them are going to be found in. But let's go ahead and get started um, by reviewing some of our terms. So again, this is going to be um, very similar to the review that we went over on Wednesday, um, but just wanted to make sure everyone's up to speed and, and on the same page when it comes to talking about the terms that we use when we're using um, grass identification. So looking at this diagram, the main stem of a grass is luckily called a stem or a comb. Then we have leaves and leaves are made up of several parts. The main part of the leaf that we would typically call a leaf is actually called a leaf blade or just a blade. And then where that leaf joins the stem, it actually wraps around the stem and forms a structure called the sheath. So that leaf blade wraps around the stem forming a sheath. And then where it ends on the stem, you have a swollen um, structure called a node. You could also think of this as a joint or a kneecap. Another term to point out is the collar region. And that is a term that can be used when referring to the juncture of the leaf blade and the leaf sheath. Okay, so this general area. So in this picture on a real grass, we have a leaf blade up top. We've pulled that blade back so we can see the sheath, which is right here. And that sheath is wrapped around our stem. Okay, this whole area right here would be the collar region. At the top of the stem, we have the inflorescence, and the inflorescence is the flowering head of a grass. Um, here, the stem becomes the rachis, so we have a different term. And then the flowering unit of a grass is called a spikelet. So over here, this would be an example of a spikelet. Here's another spikelet, okay? And this contains a whole bunch of different parts and pieces that we're not gonna dive into in much detail, uh, but it contains all of the flowering parts of the grass, and this is where the seeds are going to develop as well. If spikelets are held on a stalk, that stalk is called a pedicel. 
um, but often I'll just refer to it as a stalk to keep things simple. And we're gonna look at different types of inflorescences soon, okay? But before we go to the next slide, let's look back at this picture of the collar region. And there's a structure here that we're gonna focus on called a ligule, and it's this structure right here. So what do ligules look like? Okay, ligules come in many different shapes and sizes, and it is just a structure that occurs in that juncture where the leaf blade becomes the leaf sheath, okay? Ligules typically are hairy or membranous, okay? Um, on the left, we have two different types of hairy ligules. So we can see it in the drawing here. We can have a short hairy ligule, like you would see on this grass here. We can have um, very long hairs that are in the ligule, like we could see on this picture here. With those membranous ligules, the membrane is kind of like a piece of skin, okay? And they're typically white, but as the season progresses or the grass ages, um, they typically turn yellow or brown, and they can even start to um, break off and fall away as well. Uh, but here we can see two um, white membranes. We have a short membranous ligule on this top grass. And we have a rather tall membranous ligule on this bottom grass, okay? Um, so typically we're not gonna, you know, get out a ruler and measure how tall um, this ligule is, but we're just gonna use, you know, some general terms, tall, short, very tall. Um, basically, if it's short, you'll be able to see it with your naked eye. If it's tall, it'll be a lot more obvious when you pull that leaf blade back. And if it's very tall, um, again, very obvious when you pull it back. And as you start to look at different um, leaves and different ligules, hopefully you'll start to, to come up with your own scale in comparing them to one another. But typically we just use, you know, short and tall. Um, not all grasses have ligules, so it is possible that you could pull that leaf blade back and you would just see a smooth surface. Um, so we have that in the top picture here. We just have this raised um, U-shaped surface that's smooth. There's no hairs and there's no membrane. So understanding if a ligule is present or what type of ligule is there is really helpful in distinguishing between different species of grasses. Okay, two other characteristics that are much less common but very helpful if you find them are oracles and horns. So oracles are extra leaf material at the base of the leaf blade that look like arms and they hug or wrap around the stem. So in the drawing, our leaf blade ends here and we've got these extensions or these arms. And in the photo, hopefully you can see one here and down at the bottom, you can see where they wrap around the stem. As you pulled this leaf blade back, you'd see those arms open up as they were pulled back um, from around the stem. We're going to look at one grass today that does have oracles. And then the other characteristic is something called horns. And these are stiff U-shaped plant material in the collar region that arises from the sheath. So in this case, our sheath comes up, forms the stiff U-shaped structure. Okay. Um, we talked about this grass on Wednesday. This is Indian grass. It's the only grass in Illinois that I have personally seen that has the U-shaped horns. So that's not to say that there aren't other ones that have it. Just in my experience, I've only come across one grass that has horns. Okay, let's move on to looking at our inflorescence types. And again, the inflorescence is that flowering head of the grass. So being able to tell which type of inflorescence you have can help you narrow down the type of grass you're looking at. And there's a few simple questions we can ask ourselves to determine what type of inflorescence we're looking at. So the main question, um, or the first question, excuse me, we're gonna ask ourselves is does the main axis or the rachis of that inflorescence branch? And if it is branched, we call it a panicle, okay? This is the most, um, common type of inflorescence that you'll see in a grass. Typically it's what you think of when you think of um, the flowering head of a grass. Um, so in this case, that main rachis branches, okay? And then the spikelets, remember those are our flowering units. They could either be on a stalk or a pedicel or they could be directly attached to the branch, okay? Um, so on the leftmost drawing, this is kind of the typical um, depiction of a panicle, but in the right we can see, you know, here we have clusters of branches that have spikelets directly attached on the end. Okay, so that is a panicle. Our other two 
um, do not have a branched axis or rachis. Okay. So then our next question to distinguish them is if the spikelets are stalked or stalkless. If they're on a stalk, we call it a raceme. And racemes get tricky. Um, so how I've found it makes sense to me is that I either have a single spikelet on a stalk or I have a collection of spikelets that is on a stalk. Okay, these typically occur in long finger like projections, like in this one we can see here. Um, once you start to see a bunch of examples of grasses that are categorized as racemes, like we've hopefully seen throughout this week, hopefully you'll start to see that theme um, of what that cluster of um, spikelets looks like. But basically, you know, we have that single unbranched axis or rachis, and then we've got stalked spikelets. Here we don't have any branching. We have a stalk with a collection of spikelets. We have stalks with collections of spikelets. It may at times be difficult to tell the difference between this as a branch versus this as a stalked collection of spikelets, but we'll try to point it out on each of our grasses today. And then if our spikelets are not stalked but directly attached to our rachis, then we call it a spike. So what does that look like? On the left, we have two different types of panicles in these two photos here. In the middle, we have those racemes. So on the top, a more traditional picture of a raceme with a spikelet on a stalk. And in the bottom, we have one of those long finger-like collections of spikelets that is collectively held on a short stalk. And then in the right, we have two examples of spikes. So we can see that there is no stalk or pedicel here, um, but that those spikelets are directly attached to the rachis. Here, it can be difficult to tell how those spikelets are attached, um, but this dense um, cluster of spikelets looks very spike-like, and um, indeed, that is what we are going to call it, a spike. A few other characteristics to point out that are helpful to look for, um, something called ons, and ons are an extension of the edge of the spikelet that resembles a bristle, but it's different than a bristle. Um, typically, they extend from the tip of the spikelet, okay? And ons can come in all different shapes and sizes. There can be more than one on per spikelet. They can be really tall, they can be really short. Um, so in the photos, you have three different examples of ons. And we can see they differ in their length. We differ in how many are per spikelet. This one has two. Um, this one over here curls when it dries and drives that spikelet into the ground, okay? So the color, type, um, number of ons, all important in distinguishing grasses from one another. And then finally, we have bristles. And bristles are um, easy to confuse with ons because they look really similar. So if we just looked at this grass right here, we might say, oh yeah, the spikelets have ons. But if we looked closer, um, we'd see that bristles are a collection of structures that are attached directly to the rachis of the grass and the spikelet sits inside that cluster. So in our drawing here, we have a spikelet and it's surrounded by these hairs called bristles rather than emerging from the tip like an on. Okay? Bristles are common in our foxtails, um, which we're gonna talk about today, which is why I made sure to include that and distinguish them from ons. Okay, with that review of terms, we're ready to get started with our topic today, which is nuisance species. So I wanted to start by exploring this term nuisance, just so we're all on the same page. And it's important to note that we use that term in a context dependent manner. So it really means that we would take a grass species and say it's a nuisance in a given setting, okay? So for example, you may have a lawn that is made of Kentucky bluegrass or composed of Kentucky bluegrass. But when that bluegrass escapes and starts growing in, say, a prairie restoration, I would say Kentucky bluegrass is a nuisance in that prairie restoration, okay? Context dependent. Um, so this means any grass growing in a place we don't want it to be growing can be considered a nuisance grass in that context. 
So I categorize today's grasses uh, because they are nuisance grasses when we find them growing in and are in and around our natural areas, okay? So a plant does not have to be non-native to be a nuisance. We have some native grasses that are quite aggressive and depending on the context that you find them in may not be desirable in that context and therefore can be considered a nuisance. So we can have native and non-native species that are a nuisance. We would consider all invasive species um, to be nuisance species because they have those traits, um, but we call them invasive because it's more specific of a term than nuisance, okay? So just to kind of clarify some of those terms, invasive species are non-native, they're introduced intentionally or unintentionally, and they cause or are likely to cause environmental and or economic harm, okay? So those three pieces make an invasive species. Um, today, I'm going to be noting if a grass is native, non-native, or invasive um, on each of the species profiles. And I got the um, information about which ones are invasive um, from the Midwest Invasive Plant Networks listing of grasses that are listed as invasive in Illinois. So if you're in a different state, um, there may be some grasses that I have listed as non-native that are invasive in your state. So it's important to look up and understand that for, for your context. Um, but the Midwest Invasive Plant Network, at least if you're in the Midwest, um, is a great resource that's really comprehensive and has information, not just on grasses, but on um, all different types of invasive plants. Okay. So again, our nuisance grasses that we have um, that we're going to cover today, I think we've got about 22 different grasses. Um, this is typically the one that we find the most diversity of grasses that we can talk about. And these are the ones that a lot of people want to know how to identify because they're the ones that we see the most often. Okay, so I decided to include quite a few more in this category um, just because they're grasses that we encounter all the time and might not know how to tell which is which. So let's get moving on our grasses for today. The first three grasses we're going to cover are foxtails in the Ceteria genus. There are six species of foxtails in this genus in Illinois, and we're gonna cover three of them that are the most common. So these are the ones that you're most likely to find. So the first one is giant foxtail, Ceteria fabiri, and this non-native grass can grow about two to four feet tall and is found in disturbed low quality areas like roadsides, yards, weedy meadows, and degraded natural areas. It has, a, it has small short hairs that are oppressed or held close to the leaf blades. So unfortunately, you're not able to see the hairs on the leaves in these photos, but if you were to have the grass in your hand and feel the leaf blade, you would feel really short hairs that are being held really close to the leaf blades. The ligule in this grass we can see in the middle picture and it is made up of stiff hairs. Okay, probably the most characteristic part of this grass is the shape of its inflorescence, which is a downward curving spike. Okay, and in general, um, this foxtail is always going to have a downward curving spike. Some of the others can curve. Um, but this one is more robust. So remember, it grows up to four feet tall. Typically, I see it growing at least four feet tall. I have seen it growing over my head um, in some locations. So that's not to say it can't get taller. And another thing to note is that the bristles on the spikelets, so remember we talked about how foxtails have bristles, not ons. There are one to three bristles surrounding each spikelet. Now you might say, that's a really um, specific characteristic that I'm looking at there, but counting the number of bristles surrounding a spikelet is going to help us distinguish the foxtails from one another. So all you have to do is go up to that inflorescence, um, pluck off a few seeds, um, and see how many bristles are held underneath that spikelet, okay? So this is giant foxtail. Next is yellow foxtail, okay? Cetaria pumila or glauca, okay? 
Um, its name has changed once or twice, so you'll see either of these um, species names associated with yellow foxtail. This non-native foxtail can be found in fields, pastures, and disturbed areas, and it grows between one to three feet tall. Um, so it is a little bit shorter in general to our giant foxtail, but you can see that their heights, their height ranges do overlap. Um, it can be distinguished because it has a hairy ligule and some sparse long hairs in the collar region. And unfortunately, you can't see them in this picture, but I did go outside and pluck a few <laughs> yellow foxtails yesterday just to check. And yes, they do. They have that hairy ligule and then some long sparse hairs at the base of the leaf blade. In this example, the spikelets are surrounded by five to 15 bristles. Okay, so no, you don't have to count all the way up to 15. Basically what I do to tell those two foxtails apart, again, I'll use my fingernail and I'll pluck a few of those spikelets off with the bristles underneath. I'll take one and then count how many bristles. And if I get past five, then I'm looking at yellow foxtail, not giant foxtail, okay? Um, a lot of people ask about color with these um, because it is called yellow foxtail. And in general, when the inflorescence is young, the bristles will be yellow. Um, and in giant foxtail, they're usually green, but then they turn a yellow color as they age. So not necessarily the best characteristic to distinguish those two, uh, because again, the colors will overlap depending on when in the season you see that grass. Okay, our third foxtail that we're going to cover is green foxtail, Ceteria viridis. This one is also found in every county in Illinois, and for some reason, I have not been able to find it. I have been trying to find this one, and in my efforts, have not been able to see this one, but it is non-native, found in lawns, pastures, vacant lots, disturbed areas, cracks in sidewalks. Um, it is a little bit shorter, growing between one and a half to two feet tall. This one has smooth leaf blades, so you're not going to find any hairs um, typically on the blades of this leaf. And it does, again, have a ligule of short white hairs. So all three of them have ligules of hairs, uh, but some had some hairs on the leaf blades. One had those long hairs down at the base of the leaf blade. Okay. And then in this case, the spikelets are surrounded by one to three bristles, so like the giant foxtail. In this case, the bristles tend to be purple when it is young. So this color is more distinctive than the last two. Um, so if you do see a foxtail that has purple bristles, it's likely that it's green foxtail. But make sure that you still pluck off a few of those spikelets and count the number of bristles that's um, clustered underneath an individual spikelet. Okay, so those are the three foxtails we're going to cover. Um, hopefully you can at least recognize it as a foxtail, but then um, can go a step further and try to distinguish them from one another. This is also a really great picture of the bristles that shows how they emerge from the bottom of the spikelet rather than at the tip like an on would. Okay, just want to point that one out while we've got that great picture. Okay, moving on from the foxtails, we have a grass called squirrel tail barley or foxtail barley, Hordium jubatum. And it is a native grass that is oftentimes found in disturbed areas in almost every county in Illinois. Personally, I prefer the name squirrel tail barley so as not to confuse it with the foxtails. I think the name foxtail barley is a little confusing, uh, but it's up to you personal preference on that one. This grass can grow one to two feet tall and it has short narrow leaves and a membranous ligule. So if we look in this picture on the right, we can see compared to some of our other grasses, um, these leaves are really short and rather narrow. It does have a spike in fluorescence that nods and you can clearly see that in the picture on the left where we have that whole um, monoculture of that grass growing. You can see that that inflorescence isn't held straight up, it nods or curves to the side. And then the spikelets have really long awns that can range um, from one up to three inches. Typically I see them on the longer end, um, closer to three inches. 
And it can be distinguished from the other four species in its genus because of that inflorescence that nods and then the length of the arms. So of the um, Hordium species in Illinois, it does have the longest arms out of all of those that we have. All right, quack grass or Elemis repens is a non-native grass that can be found in pastures, abandoned fields, and roadsides. It grows about one to two feet tall and it has a short membranous ligule and it has oracles. So remember those arm-like structures. Um, this picture on the left should look familiar because we've seen it when we describe oracles. And this is that one grass that we're talking about today that does have that structure present. So if you see that, that is a great clue that should hopefully lead you in the direction of quack grass. So the inflorescence of this grass can be considered either a spike or a raceme. Um, I've seen both definitions and I'm starting to now describe things that look like one but are technically another as a spike-like raceme. So it looks like a spike. Technically, it's a raceme. I personally don't see the pedicels or the stalks that attach them um, with the naked eye, but apparently they are there. Um, so again, up to you on how you personally categorize it to help you remember it. Um, a spike-like raceme makes sense to me, so we're going to go with that for today. Um, the spikelets appear to zigzag along the rachis. So we saw another grass that did this too, but you can see how that rachis appears to zigzag. In this case, the spikelets are held relatively um, erect, straight up. They're not held out to the side. That could also help you distinguish this species. All right, Timothy, flume pretense is our next grass. And this is the only species in its genus in Illinois. Um, so Timothy is a non-native. It can be found in every county in our state, in fields, pastures, and along roadsides. Commonly um, has been planted as a pasture forage grass, but if it gets out into some of our um, natural areas, um, it's not desirable in those areas. It is a cool season grass, so it's going to um, grow and produce its inflorescence early in the um, spring or early summer. It typically grows about two to three and a half feet tall. It does have a membranous ligule, and we can see that in the picture on the right. It's rather tall um, and a little bit ragged on the edges. Its inflorescence is a spike, and the spikelets have very short ons that make the spikelets have the appearance of having a U-shaped edge. And unfortunately, in this picture, it's a little challenging to see, but on this top spikelet here, hopefully you can see these very small ons that come out from both sides of the spikelet and make it appear um, U-shaped on the tip. But really distinctive um, spike inflorescence um, that looks different from a lot of the other grasses that we're going to be covering. All right, reed canary grass, Phalaris arundinacea, um, is considered um, an invasive plant uh, by the Midwest Invasive Plant List in Illinois. And this plant is really interesting because um, there are debates on where it's native to. So it has been determined um, and that it's native to Europe, parts of Asia, and then also possibly the Northwestern United States. Um, but it is in Illinois considered an invasive plant. Um, so this one's a little bit interesting, um, but because of its aggressive nature, it has been categorized as invasive in our state. Um, it typically grows in swamps, marshes, and moist meadows or wetter parts of prairie restorations. That's where I've seen it a lot. And it can grow between three to five feet tall. Um, the leaf bases of this grass are quite wide wide where they wrap around the stem to form the sheath. So some grasses will taper toward the base of the leaf um, before it becomes the sheath and this grass does not. Um, it stays very wide at the base and I'm trying to see if we can see maybe on this leaf right here you can see how it's still really wide at the base where it's going to wrap and form the sheath. 
Um, these leaves may have an M-shaped crimp on them. Um, so again, hard to see in this photo, but right here, if you ran your finger along this blade, you'd feel an M-shaped crimp. Um, they also have a white membranous ligule. So because of that ligule and this M-shaped crimp, I get this grass confused with the next one that we're going to talk about. Um, but the inflorescences look very different. So in reed canary grass, our inflorescence is a panicle, and it's a rather contracted panicle. So if we look in the picture here, if we look at this inflorescence, it looks really spike-like, but that's because it hasn't fully opened yet. Um, so over here, um, this is the same grass, this panicle has opened all the way up, okay? Um, after it flowers, um, it will contract again when it dries out and will look like a spike. Um, so this one's a little bit confusing, might not realize that it's a panicle, um, depending on when you see it. Okay, so this is reed canary grass. Next up is smooth brome, Bromus enormus. And this non-native grass can be found in disturbed areas, prairies, savannas, and um, other areas as well. It typically grows between two and three and a half feet tall. And this one has that distinctive M-shaped crimp in the leaves, okay? So we just said reed canary grass has that crimp as well. Smooth brome has it right here, okay? Um, so how can we tell these apart? Um, Mostly I look for habitat. So reed canary likes wetter areas, whereas smooth brome prefers drier areas. Um, and this grass also has something called an open sheath. And we haven't talked about this um, in this webinar series. And unfortunately, the picture I chose doesn't illustrate it. But we talked about how a leaf blade, you know, becomes the sheath where it wraps around the stem. Okay, so you've got this material of the leaf that wraps around and hugs the stem. In some cases, it doesn't wrap fully around and overlap, but it leaves a V shape, okay? That means that it's an open sheath. So if you looked in the collar region of smooth brome, before you pulled the leaf blade back, you'd see that the sheath doesn't fully overlap at the top, but it leaves an open V shape, okay? Um, it has a short membranous ligule. This picture should look familiar. I've used this one a lot as an example. Um, and then it has a panicle in fluorescence. And the spikelets are um, smooth and rather elongated and typically green. And then they turn reddish later in the season. And later in the season as well, this panicle will curve to the side and all of the spikelets will hang off one side of the panicle. Um, this is a cool season grass. So in the summer and fall, when the panicle curves to the side, um, <clears throat> the leaves also curl when they dry and rustle in the wind. So they'll curl and form these tight spirals um, that are held down next to the stem. And that's one characteristic I look for, you know, later in the summer, if I see a dried up grass with those tightly curled um, leaves, it gives me a clue that I'm looking at smooth brown. All right, so smooth brome was one of our brome species we're going to talk about today. Cheatgrass is another one, Bromus tectorum. And um, to recap, there are 20 different species of bromes in our state. We covered um, one, I think just one other one throughout the course of, of this webinar series. Um, so cheatgrass, you may also hear it referred to as downy brome. And it can be found in barren savannas, fields, landfills, and roadsides. It has a really fibrous root system and develops and spreads very quickly. Typically, it only grows between 8 and 16 inches tall, so it's relatively short compared to a lot of our other grasses. Its leaf blades and sheaths are very hairy. And then cheatgrass has a very distinctive inflorescence that strongly droops and the spikelets have long awns that spread far apart, forming a V-shape. So this characteristic inflorescence we can see in this picture on the right, and a lot of the times um, you see it when it's dried up because this is a cool season grass, so it's going to develop early in the season. Um, so later in the summer, this is what you would find 
Um, so we have that drooping panicle, the branches are drooping, and then those spikelets are held open very wide with those long awns. Um, this grass is an annual and it has really taken over um, in more of our states out west and has actually contributed to an increase in our wildfires because it produces so much thatch every year. So it's actually um, altering and changing the fire regimes um, further out west. So this is definitely one. Um, it's not listed as invasive in Illinois, but I would definitely um, watch it for sure um, because it, it has had such an effect um, further out, out west. Okay, common reed or Phragmites australis, or you can refer to it simply as Phragmites, as a lot of people do. Um, this is an Illinois invasive plant of concern, can be found in wet areas, swamps, marshes, and highway roadsides. That's typically where I see it. Um, it is a very, very robust grass. The largest of the grasses are covering this week. Easily surpasses 10 feet in height, up to about 15 feet tall, but it wouldn't surprise me if you've seen it even taller. Um, this grass can have a, a crimp, an M-shaped crimp in the leaf, but can be easily distinguished from smooth brome and reed canary by the sheer size of the leaves, which are much broader, like at least twice as broad as the leaves of the other two grasses. So hopefully you can see just how big these leaves are in this photo on the left here. Um, it does have a ling ligule that is a fringe of hairs. And then a large panicle inflorescence will develop in the late summer. And at first it's purplish in color before it dries and turns um, more brown in color. Um, this one's really hard to eradicate because any fragment of the plant can um, re-root and continue growing. Um, so if you did any sort of mechanical removal of this plant and broke it up in the process and didn't get all of those pieces out, um, you can just be contributing to the continued spread of it. So unfortunately, this is one um, that is very widespread and very difficult to get rid of. All right, Kentucky bluegrass or Poa pretensis is one of 18 bluegrass species in Illinois. And this may sound familiar um, because you may have Kentucky bluegrass in your lawn. I know I do at my house. Um, while it has the word Kentucky in its name, it's actually non-native from Europe. Um, commonly found in pastures, degraded prairies, open woods, other disturbed areas. Um, it is a cool season grass and it grows between one to two and a half feet tall, although often we don't let it get that tall. Um, and it has thin leaves with a keeled or a boat shaped tip. So in this picture on the right, um, hopefully you can tell that the tip of that leaf looks kind of like the tip of a canoe, okay? So it's not flat, um, but it's joined together forming that um, boat shaped tip. Um, so I encourage people to go out, if you don't know what you have in your lawn, um, go out um, after, you know, a week after you've mowed, um, after you've cut all of the tips off of the blades of grass and see if you have any boat shaped tips because you might have a bluegrass in your yard. Um, Kentucky bluegrass has a round stem and we're going to use that to distinguish it from another bluegrass on the next slide. And then it has a panicle inflorescence. Again, something we typically don't see if we have it in our lawn because we're mowing it before it is able to put out that inflorescence. Okay, uh, we call this a nuisance grass, not when it's growing in your lawn and you're trying to care for it and keep it there, but if it escapes into, you know, some of our other natural areas. So um, in surveys that I did on prairies and prairie restorations, this was all over the place. Um, not really causing any issues, but it, it was there, um, was present kind of in the, in the understory of those areas. Okay, Canada bluegrass, Poa compressa, um, has a lot of the same characteristics as Kentucky bluegrass. Um, when looking at the places that it's found, this one tends to be found in a little um, higher quality habitats, so more dry upland woods and prairies. Um, but still, again, pastures disturbed areas, it can be there as well. Um, it has those thin leaves with the boat shaped tip. And in the case of Canada bluegrass, the stem is flattened or compressed. OK, 
okay, you get that from the Latin name. So instead of being able to twirl the stem around in, in between your two fingers and it's round, like Kentucky bluegrass and Canada bluegrass, you would tell that it's flattened, okay? Um, has a panicle inflorescence just like our Kentucky bluegrass. Okay, red top, Agrastus gigantea, can sometimes be confused with um, the bluegrasses. Um, and there are seven species in this genus in Illinois, and they're known as bent grasses. Okay, red top is non native, found in degraded prairies, moist meadows. Uh, it's a rather slender rhizomatous grass that can grow two to three feet tall. So this one is a bit taller than our bluegrasses, and its leaves are wider than you would expect based on the size of the rest of the grass. Um, so they, they can be up to almost half an inch broad um, rather than thin like the leaves of Kentucky bluegrass, okay? Um, so when you see the stem and then the inflorescence of this grass, um, you would expect that it would have really thin leaves, but it has these wider, broader leaves. Um, so that's one clue that I'm looking at red top. Um, the leaves have pointed tips, so they're not keeled or boat shaped. And then this grass has a very tall ligule. It can be up to a quarter of an inch tall. Very obvious when you pull that leaf blade back that you have that membranous ligule. Um, so we can see it right here. Um, and then the inflorescence is a panicle of red spikelets that have a silky texture. Okay. When I first learned how to identify red top, um, it didn't have it's inflorescence and I couldn't figure out what, just based on the leaves, couldn't figure out what type of grass it was and noticed it had this really tall ligule. And then it started flowering and it clicked that I was looking at red top. So in future years, when I was out surveying sites, I always looked for that really tall ligule um, to help clue me in that I was looking at red top before it had that panicle inflorescence. All right, stink grass is next, Aragrostis cilianensis. Unfortunately, it doesn't have a pleasant name, but it's aptly named uh, because the foliage or the leaves have an unpleasant odor. Um, so earlier in the week, we talked about purple lovegrass, and that's in the same genus as stink grass. Really interesting names for these grasses in the same genus. Lovegrass sounds really pleasant, stink grass sounds really unpleasant. Um, but this non-native grass can be found commonly on roadsides, in gardens and pastures, grows about one to two and a half feet tall. And one of the really cool identifying characteristics for this grass is to look for glands along the margins or the edges of the leaf blades. So this picture on the left illustrates that very well. You can see um, these glands that are all along the edge of the leaf. Now we saw another grass on Wednesday that had glands on the edge of the leaf, but those glands had hairs coming off of them. That was Cytoscramma. In this case, there aren't hairs on the glands. We just have those structures, the glands by themselves, okay? Um, let's see, leaves have an unpleasant odor, which we already mentioned, hence the name. And you can see the hairy ligule as well, um, kind of expands out in the, the um, base of the leaf sheath as well, um, but does have a hairy ligule. And then there's a large panicle of flattened spikelets that you can see in the photo on the right, how flat those spikelets are. The inflorescence itself can be six to 12 inches tall and up to five inches wide. So that, that inflorescence structure makes up a large portion of the size of the overall grass. All right, tall fescue is up next. Um, has a new Latin name that I'm not going to try to pronounce, um, but I learned it as Festuca arundinacea. Um, so you may still see that name floating around. It does have that new Latin name as well. Um, is a non-native, can be found in fields, roadsides, and forest openings. It has been widely planted for livestock forage and as a lawn grass. So this is another, you may see fescue in your grass seed mix. Um, again, if you're intentionally planting it in your lawn or in your pasture, it's not a nuisance there, but if it gets out and escapes into other areas, then it would be considered a nuisance in those areas. 
Okay. Um, it is a cool season grass that can grow about six feet tall and its leaves remain green in the winter and in the spring. So that is a good characteristic if you are out and you see a bright green grass in the winter time. Um, that's your first clue that you might be looking at tall fescue. The leaves are really stiff and they're sharply angled at the collar. And you can see that in the photo on the right, um, the way that those leaf blades are held out at this angle um, is a little bit distinctive. They're not floppy in any way. They're not held straight up, um, but held out at that angle. Um, the leaves are mostly found at the base of the grass, so not too many are going to um, occur along the stem. And um, they do have a short membranous ligule. The inflorescence is a panicle, uh, but the dried seed head resembles a spike. So I wasn't able to catch it um, when you could tell that it was a panicle. I caught the dried seed head here, which really looks spike-like. Um, and I always miss it when it is um, flowering. I've only ever seen the dried um, inflorescence of tall fescue. This is one grass that I never was able to find any distinctive characteristics for. I always avoided um, identifying something positively as tall fescue. Um, but now I think if you look for that dark green color that persists in winter and spring, the sharply angled um, leaves, that has been enough for me to, to start to confidently say, yes, that one is tall fescue. Um, whereas before I'd always kind of wavered and said, mm, I think it's that, but I'm not going to say for sure. Okay, orchard grass um, is a non-native grass found in old fields, pastures, and disturbed areas in every county of Illinois. It's the only species in its genus in our state, and it has been commonly planted for forage. It grows three to six feet tall and is a cool season grass. Its membranous ligule can be between a quarter and a quarter and a half of an inch tall. So this is another grass that has a really tall membranous ligule. The blades of the leaves and the sheaths are keeled. Um, so remember, that means it looks like you folded them in half like a piece of paper, and then they have that crease running down the back of them. The spikelets are arranged in a panicle, um, and they're grouped in these rounded looking clusters. Um, the branches of the panicle tend to just emerge off of opposite sides rather than emerging around the um, entire radius of the stem. Um, like you see in a more open panicle. So in this case, if you laid um, the inflorescence down on a piece of paper, it would probably sit flat because those branches are just coming off from the left and the right side, not emerging from the left and the right and the front and the back, if that makes sense. All right, Japanese stilt grass, Microstegium viminium, is an Illinois invasive plant of concern. If you are not familiar with it, please learn to identify it and report it if you see an infestation. It is extremely common now in southern Illinois and is working its way up the state. Um, it is an annual grass and it can be found in woods, wetter areas, and roadsides, but I have also seen it growing in wide open sunny areas. So um, pretty much everywhere you can find this one growing. Typically grows between one to three and a half feet tall. And it has short curved leaves with a prominent silvery colored off center mid vein. That was a lot of descriptors. So let's go through those. We have short curved leaves and we've got a silvery colored mid vein that's a little bit off center. It looks pretty pretty close to centered on this one here. Um, but if you look at some others, you can see that it is off center, re re really silvery or gray in color. Um, the stem can be slightly hairy. And then I have always heard this inflorescence described as a spike. Um, and until yesterday, I was out and I took this picture in the middle. And I looked at it and I realized that's not a spike, that's a racine. Okay, so I had only ever seen it where it was just starting to flower and it only had one spike-like structure that had emerged. But when it's in full flowering, you can see here we have our rachis, 
we have a little stalk, a stalk, and a stalk, and then we've got those finger-like clusters of spikelets. So technically, this grass does have a raceme. So again, to try to meet somewhere in the middle, we're going to call it a spike-like raceme because depending on what time of the year you find it, it might just look like you have one of these um, clusters that has emerged from the grass. Okay, so again, if you see stilt grass, um, pull it out. It's an annual, so it comes right out of the ground. Um, and if it's in a county that it hasn't been found in, um, you, can, you can look that up on a website called EdMaps. Um, Peggy, if you remind me at the end, you can put that in the chat box. Um, you can report those sightings so that we make sure we can, we can prevent this one from spreading um, everywhere. All right, Johnson grass is next, sorghum. Helipensi, and it's an Illinois invasive plant of concern, and it's also listed as a noxious weed in Illinois. Okay, so that's not a term that we throw around. Noxious weed is a legal term, um, and you can look up the Illinois noxious weed law to get more information on um, managing this grass. Um, but we do also designate it as invasive. Can be found pastures, roadsides. I see it all over the place, everywhere on the roadside. Um, it is a large, robust bunch grass, although the way that it grows so abundantly, you might not be able to tell that it is bunch grass. Um, it has a ligule of velvety hairs. Um, so here I pulled back my leaf blade. We've got hairs that if you um, were able to feel the texture would feel very velvety. Um, the panicle is um, very open and large and it has reddish on spikelets. So in this photo, we can see those ons that are present here. A lot of people ask me how to tell switchgrass, which we talked about on Wednesday, and Johnson grass, um, how to tell them apart. Um, so looking at the panicles, switch grasses branches are held um, much stiffer and it's a lot more open and airy than Johnson grass, which is a little bit more densely packed with spikelets. And then Johnson grasses spikelets have ons, whereas switchgrass does not. So there are no ons on switchgrass spikelets. Okay. Um, a few other characteristics to point out. There is a really prominent white midrib on Johnson grass. And later in the season, it typically turns red. And about this time of year, starting in September and moving into October, Johnson grass just looks really sick. The leaves have turned brown and red and are really spotty. Um, it looks like they've been sprayed with herbicide even when they haven't been. Um, and that's not gonna be the case on switchgrass. Um, something else I just discovered with Johnson grass is the stems are glaucous, okay? And that means that they're covered with a whitish substance that you can rub off. So here you can see this spot I was holding onto the stem and I rubbed the stem and this whitish substance came off. Okay, so here this was covering the whole stem and I rubbed it off here. Okay, um, what's the purpose of this coating? I've seen that it can help repel water, make it harder for insects to climb up the plant, uh, but that's just another clue for you to look for. If you think you're looking at Johnson grass, um, rub the stem and see if a white substance comes off. All right, we couldn't have a grass ID program called Which Grass is Which without talking about which grass. So which grass is another grass in the Panicum genus, Panicum capillary, and we've identified a few of these already. So this native grass can grow up to three feet tall, but typically is found in disturbed areas, fields, glades, um, and isn't necessarily indicative of a high quality area if you find it. It's a summer annual and its leaves vary in their hairiness um, and the leaf sheaths have long spreading hairs. So our leaf blades can be hairy, but they don't have to be, but the sheaths are going to be, okay? Um, in this picture, the leaf sheaths are overlapping. So this isn't the stem here, this is a sheath and you can see how hairy it is. There are short hairy ligules that you can see really clearly in this photo here. And then we have a large open airy panicle that has a hairy rachis, okay? But this um, fountain shape 
panicle that's emerging out of these leaf blades is really typical for witchgrass. All right, we are coming up on our last few grasses for today. Um, so our next one is fall panicum or panicum dicotomiflorum. That one I had to take a breath before I said that. Um, at first when I saw this grass, I thought I was looking at a really big witch grass. Um, and then I started looking for some other clues and realized it was a separate species. Okay, first of all, this grass was too tall. I saw it growing up to four feet tall and its leaf sheets were not hairy. So here you can see, uh, I don't see any hairs on those leaf sheets. So those were two clues that this was something close to witch grass, but it's something different. Um, so this grass can be found in every county in Illinois, almost, um, in disturbed areas and fields. It is also a summer annual, has spreading floppy leaves. Um, the, the leaf blades can be hairy to some extent, but the leaf sheaths are always going to be hairless. So that's one way to tell it apart from witch grass. Um, the ligule is white and hairy and very strongly um, like upside down U-shaped. Okay, so a lot of the ligules we've seen um, kind of occurred straight across, right? Like that witch grass, it went straight across. In this grass, it's very curved. Okay. Um, the panicles are large, open, and airy, measuring over a foot tall. Um, this is another one you might confuse with switchgrass, but the ligule is different. So remember in switchgrass, we had a triangle of long white hairs in the collar region, um, whereas with this one, we have that really strongly upside down U shape of short white hairs. Okay, up next, we have two of the five species of crabgrass in Illinois. And these two are the really common and widespread species that you'd find. So first up is common or hairy crabgrass, Digitaria sanguinalis. And I like to use the common name um, hairy crabgrass because the other one we're gonna talk about is smooth. And if I was comparing hairy and smooth, that gives me some clues. But if I was comparing common and smooth, I might not be able to remember what characteristics go with which one, okay? Um, so this non-native can be found in poor quality prairies, meadows, wetlands, disturbed areas, lawns in every county in our state. It can grow one to three feet tall. And the leaf sheaths almost cover the entire stem and they're covered in long white hairs that we can see in this photo here, okay? The base of the leaf blades can also have some hairs. And then the inflorescence is a raceme with spikelets that are paired along a flattened stalk. So here we have a flattened stalk. We've got pairs of spikelets along that and they're held in a raceme. Um, typically, I don't put measurements of spikelets in here, um, but I did because we're comparing two similar species. So the spikelets are about three millimeters long. Um, so these spikelets are going to be larger than in our other crabgrass. Okay, so this was hairy crabgrass. Now we have smooth, digitaria, ooh, ischimum. That's gonna be my best guess for how to pronounce that one. This crabgrass is a little bit shorter, growing up to a foot and a half tall, can be found in similar low quality areas. And in this species, the leaf sheets are hairless. So you may still have some hairs at the base of the leaf blade, but the sheath itself is going to be hairless. It's gonna have the same Receive inflorescence with pairs of spikelets along the flattened stalk. And in this case, the spikelets are a little bit smaller, two millimeters in size. Um, so if you wanted to get that close, you can to tell the difference between them. But honestly, I mostly just look for the hairy um, leaf sheets. And if they're present, then it's hairy crabgrass. All right, so roll it in right at 11 o'clock. We're gonna do our review. We made it through the whole week of which grass is which. So again, Starting with the inflorescence. If you have it present, it's like having a flower on a flowering plant and starting there. That's where we want to start. What type of inflorescence do we have? Are there ons present on our spikelets? What type? What size? What color? Is there one per spikelet? Is there two or three? Um, if we don't have an inflorescence, or if we do and we want to just confirm, we can move on to some leaf characteristics. So always, always, always look for a ligule, pull that leaf blade back. That's the first thing I do when I'm trying to identify a grass. Um, are there hairs on the grass? Are there hairs on the leaves, on the sheaths, on the stem? 
where the hairs are at, what type of hairs, and then if there's any distinctive colors. We've talked about a couple grasses that are really um, blue or gray in color, and um, there aren't too many of them that have different colors, so noting those um, can be really helpful as well. All right, so we have reached the end of our week, and I just want to say thank you um, to everyone who has joined us. We've had such an amazing response to this webinar series. Um, so like Peggy said at the beginning, please um, take a moment to scan that QR code um, or go to this link that will get posted in the chat box, um, go.illinois.edu. Um, backslash grass ID evaluation, eval, excuse me. Um, and we will be following up with an email that has this information as well. If it's easier for you to just wait until that email comes to your inbox, um, we'll be sending that out later today. So Peggy, I'm gonna go ahead mm -hmm. and turn it over to you if you have any questions. We do, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Making sure first. Yeah, um, lots of, um, Excellent job, best course, great help. <laughs> all that stuff, I'd love to tell you all. You'll have to look at it later. <laughs> There's lots of good stuff. So what I did is I copied them over to keep track and back a little near the um, beginning, um, which ones, and you don't have to do all of them at this point. It's just hard uh, folks with the chat, you know, and we don't wanna be interruptive, but um, could you advise which plants, and some of them you did mention are annual versus perennial, like just a little review of a few of them maybe. Um, yeah, <laughs> I know, I know. A lot of the times, and I, I can't say this for sure, but a lot of the times, if it was an annual, I said an annual, yeah, and then yeah, if not, then it's likely that it's a perennial. But again, don't hold me to that because I didn't necessarily follow that too closely. Um, but so in the recording, we'll pick up on all the annual ones probably because I heard annual a lot. So yeah, and then again, any of the um, like the Illinois wildflowers web page has all of that information as well. So if there's a specific one you're wondering okay. on, um, nice. you can just look it up there. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, Jane was asking if there were any desirable native foxtails. I like um, them. <laughs> and depends on your definition. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so for me, not really, but um, yeah, those are the three most common ones and I have not heard people say that they are necessarily desirable, but okay. um, again, depending on your context. Could be. Right, like behind <laughs> my fence where they at least fill in and aren't something really bad. <laughs> um, so the next question, does a crimp typically occur at a certain spot along the blade or could it be anywhere along the length? That's a great question. So in smooth brome, um, it's typically like in the middle of the grass. And if I remember correctly, there's usually only one crimp. I know in Phragmites, it has multiple and they're like along the blade. Um, but yeah, otherwise it would vary. Mm -hmm. Not quite okay. sure. Okay. Um, how tall is smooth brome compared to reed canary grass? Um, so reed canary will get, you know, five to six feet tall, smooth brome, oh, about, what did I say? I think about three, three feet tall is what I typically see. And another way to tell, it's, it's challenging. And I struggled a lot when I was first identifying those two because I was, um, surveying prairie restoration sites and they occurred in the same area. Um, typically, and again, unless you had them side by side, it's hard to tell, but reed canary, the leaves and the foliage is a darker green and smooth brome is a lot brighter. So again, I know distinguishing the type of green is getting really tricky and it might be different for you. Um, but that's one thing that I found useful as well. And then reed canary tends to get some of um, some like reddish spots on it, kind of like Johnson grass, not as bad um, later in the season, whereas smooth brome typically does it. Um, so just looking at the foliage, you might be able to get some comparisons there as well. Nice. Uh, question was, do you know if there's a function for the M-shaped crimps in the leaves? Because I think, because you said M shape, you know, for identifying, is there yeah, a function to that? I do not know that there is a function for, for that structure. Now I need to go see what I can yeah. find. <laughs> you know, the audience always gets us thinking more. I love it. I know, um, yeah. <laughs> there, 
there was a there was a question of um, did we have a native Phragmites um, and someone felt there might be and then how to tell the difference if they're you know native to yes that's challenging so there is um, a native Phragmites and at this point um, kind of the standing um, at least that I've heard is that we kind of assume that most of what we have is the invasive or the not and the non-native version and in that case the native and the non-native versions of Phragmites actually um, hybridized too so it's oh, wow. really challenging to tell them apart um, there was there was a really great study that I read that was distinguished and it was years ago distinguishing between them um, but it's kind of gotten to the point where we whether this is the right thing to do, but we just kind of assume um, that what we have is the, the non-native, um, at least in our area in Illinois, it might be different in some other states. But again, sure. I can't speak specifically to that because it's been a while since I've um, referenced that, that paper. Right, that makes sense. Um, when not flowering, how can we tell red top from reed canary grass, which also has the wide leaf base and Mm. Um, so they are different sized plants. So reed canary is more robust because it does get up to five feet tall. Red top is going to be only about three feet tall and it's more slender. Mm -hmm. um, so the um, leaves of reed canary grass are going to be, you know, two to three times as broad as red top. Mm is. Okay. Red top has a broad leaf for the size of the grass that it is. Mm -hmm. um, so again, a lot of the times I could easily confuse it when it has the panicle, um, especially when the panicle is dried, I can confuse it with the blue grasses, but it has a wide, um, wider leaf than a mm -hmm. blue grass does, but we're still on the scale of a shorter grass, like a blue grass versus reed canary, which is much larger. And someone reminded me, and I had it in my notes, where do we report the stilt grass we were supposed to ask? Oh, yes. Um, so I will type, um, there is a website called Ed Maps. Um, if you just type that in, it should take you there. Um, and you can enter information on any invasive species that you see. So even some of the ones in my presentation today that I called non-native, um, depending on where you are in the country and you know, even where you are in the state, you might have a grass that isn't technically considered an invasive, but it acts like an invasive in your area. So you're going to manage it, right? Um, so there's a lot of um, these species are all being monitored and you can enter that information on um, at, in Ed Maps. Um, and then they'll verify if you have pictures, that's always great to put in there um, just to keep track of where these species are moving. Okay. Um, a question that, and I know you and I are not in the, um, in the livestock portion of extension, but um, Charles had asked if, if you knew if any of the grasses were considered nutritious in a pasture um, for animals because we see them, you know, so commonly out there. Probably. Right, and yes, like you said, I wouldn't be able to speak to that. I know a lot of these, um, are planted um, as pasture or forage um, species. And Which can because be of that, have then, you know, <laughs> in a lot of areas like where prairie restoration is occurring, you know, we're taking those old fields and then those species are remaining there. So that's why we consider them a nuisance in that context. Um, but yeah, the specific, uh, I wouldn't be able to get into the specifics. <laughs> no, neither would I, but I like that question because there's where there's needs one way, one place, there wouldn't be a need in another. So it's good to, good to understand. Mm -hmm. um, this is a two part. Um, and I think, uh, does a short membra membranous ligule actually stand proud from base of leaf blade or top of sheath? The second portion, wondering how closely non ligule or short membranous ligule resemble each other. Does a short membranous ligule actually stand proud from base of leaf blade or top of sheath? That's a great question on where, like where exactly the ligule is derived from. Maybe, yeah, <laughs> San, Sandra. Was from asking. what I would, um, it's really at that juncture, like right where they come together. Mm -hmm. It's typically 
where it occurs. So I'm not sure if it is arising from the sheath or if it's, you know, an extension of the blade. I'm leaning towards the sheath, but that's just me right. putting an opinion out there. Well, well and um, I think, and I think, cause it's so hard to see non or short, you know, that's kind of where the question leads us is, is it, it how do you, you know, when it's not, when it's not there, but you're searching for that. And then it's, when a it's short. <laughs> right, right. Cause some of them are really short and it's hard to tell. Um, and when I've seen the grasses that don't have a ligule, they have like a raised smooth surface. So like mm. in um, barnyard grass that we talked about on Wednesday, I believe, it was a really smooth raised surface. So you could run your finger along that and not feel any, you know, small remnants of a membrane um, from that area. But yeah, it can be tricky. And especially if you're looking at really, really small grasses. Um, it can be hard sometimes to, to distinguish that. Um, <laughs> I love that you guys think I can say all these words. <laughs> Elamus, <laughs> Elamus canadensis is a native grass that might remind you of foxtail for aesthetic concerns. I'm not sure about that, Kathy. I can't. Must be a grass that, that might it's, be. Yeah, it's another one we talked about. So Canada okay. wild rye. Um, oh, okay. it also has like that nodding seed head. Um, this is so why you're the grass has burned. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Yay. Um, okay, cool. Um, mm -hmm. looking through the, I had everything else copied, but there's a lot. I heard native Phragmites has a purple mark on the comb is pull something. Comb is pull the leaf sheath back. If you pull the leaf sheath back. Oh, Okay. I, the, I have not heard that, but that's something, something to, look to, to look into. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it might be something, if I may, that might be an age thing. Like, you know, everybody thinks poison ivy is red and it's once in a while when it's younger, it has some red on it, but that's then they're looking for that when it's older and get and end up getting poison ivy because someone said it always has it, you know, so it might be something. Um, right. The colors can change, colors can yeah. change for sure. But yeah, that's something to, um, to look into i'm going to look into it more and see yeah, be, <laughs> i want to know yeah. yeah we love it when you guys share stuff we can find out if it's true and and then use that too to help people um there is a grass around my pond that sticks to my skin when i pull it is that reed canary <laughs> i wish i could say for sure but without being able to see pictures of it um i would not be able to tell you for certain so um, not that I want, you know, hundreds of people sending me grass pictures to identify, but if you do have a specimen and you're able to take good, crisp, clean pictures of the inflorescence, of the ligule, of the leaf blade, um, you know, some of those sure. identifying characteristic spots that we've talked about, um, it's possible that I may be able to identify it. Nice. That's, it's pretty the wrap up. Martha, I apologize. You can't hear my voice as well as you'd like to. I've had a lot of audio on my end. Thank goodness I'm not the speaker today. Um, and Martha said she saw birds stripping seeds from the foxtail. Mm -hmm. And that can be a good thing for the bird, but it can be a bad thing for us because then they're going to poop, you know, those exactly. seeds are in their waste. Yeah. So as lovely as, you know, they'll find something else to eat too. So we want to be careful what we plant, mm -hmm. you know, and feed them with something that's native versus non-native. Um, one last question from Pat. I am yet confused about the term rac rachis. Would you please go over it once again? Oh, okay. The rachis is the stem of the inflorescence. Mm. So sometimes it can be challenging to distinguish where the stem becomes the rachis. Um, but uh, I'm trying to see if we could, maybe on this grass in this picture here, um, we have a stem. And then I see spikelets up top. So oh, the one in your picture right yeah, here. Yeah, in my screen. picture on the Okay, screen. right yeah. up your shoulder. So where the spikelets are attached, that portion of the stem is called a rachis. Oh, I hope that helps, Pat. And everybody, um, thank you so much for joining us. I didn't get to hear Wednesday, so I'm uh, going to have to go back myself. Remember that uh, to please, please, please do the evaluation. Thank you for all your kind words about the presentation. I know Erin will feel great when she sees those. Um, and you can QR code this for the eval. You can also go to the, go do the goillinois.edu, one below it. 
and look forward. It'll be, it could be a week, it could be three weeks. We don't know uh, once the closed captioning is done, Erin will make sure she sends out the recording so you can listen to it as often as needed to, to refresh um, your memory on all this information. And I hope you all have an incredibly good weekend. Erin, thank you for being such a great speaker and knowing way too much about grass for me. I'm gonna, I have the advantage of knowing her personally. So I'm just gonna have to ask lots of questions. So <laughs> thanks a lot, everybody and have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Thank you everyone. Thank you, Peggy. Mm -hmm.